Thank you very much, Tis. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Um, yes, so, clear. Great. So Mary and I are very excited to um, um, have this conversation with you. Um, we will be presenting this jointly and we're sort of doing an introduction to our team and we're delighted that there are others here with tons of experience. I see Neha Singh on the call as well as Neil Spicer and all of you working with country teams. So I'm hoping there'll be um, inputs as we go along. And for those of you who are already skilled in health policy analysis, that you'll bring your own insights into this or even your practical experience. So um, I will kick off first speaking and then Mary will, I think we have a slide. Um, this is the structure of our presentation, our session with you today. Uh, we'll give you a little bit of an overview about our group. Um, Mary will be leading an introductory session on health policy analysis, laying the groundworks. And we are hoping to pause at different points to get your feedback on the way in which you think there are, you've experienced health policy analysis, your own perspectives on it, um, and that will lay the path for uh, next steps. And then we thought we'd present some of the work we've done and would like to continue in terms of analysis of planning documents in the GFF. So that's the rough outline for today. Uh, let me keep going. So for those of you who don't know the drivers group, um, previously Countdown 2030 in its previous life had a health systems group and a health financing group. Um, the London School is still leading the financing work, but the health systems group turned into this broader um, group called the drivers group. And we wanted to look at what are the things that catalyze change in health systems. Uh, we wanted to move away from the building blocks approach. Um, so I'm just going to do one slide of the work we did. Uh, we obviously contributed Countdown 20. 30 has the country profiles, and we help to update the country profiles, the health systems um, section of that, reorganizing it and leading multiple consultations on what should be the indicators there. We then undertook four streams of work that looked at different levels of the health system. So we, there was an envelope of work around digital health that really looked at various ways in which digital health was shaping um, how programs were delivered, how women interacted with digital health applications, and importantly, how government um, was responding to digital health in, in innovations. And I'm really happy we worked with NHSRC in setting up a community of practice in India. And we'll have a supplement coming out uh, in India with a range of government, civil society, and researcher experience on scaling up digital health applications. Mary has been our lead on quality of care, looking at the MISO level. What are the organizational reforms that are needed to um, improve quality of care, particularly for maternal and perinatal death um, surveillance and review? And we'll be sharing some of the results on that. And then we wanted to look at, so you have digital health, quality of care, which is sort of an organizational issues that touches at multiple levels, but also we wanted two cross-cutting areas of work. And one has been adolescent health because they're a key vulnerable population and often left behind, and we'll be presenting on that. And then gender, um, which falls often both adolescent and health the responsibility for action sometimes falls outside of the health sector. And that's why we took that on. So we contributed to three supplements, two that were led to, by Countdown, one led by UNU, and one which we led ourselves. And we have a whole host in the last three years of publications, conference panels, um, linkages with WHO technical working groups, um, and various other ways of getting our work out. So, we have some of this on the Countdown pro, uh, website. So if you're interested in some of the outputs, that's a good starting place. Um, so what are we going to do next? So um, we have a small, we are continuing the collaboration with Countdown 2030. 
and we thought we would do a series of presentations or policy briefs about key areas that are often misunderstood by the broader sort of more programmatic maternal child health audience. Um, one was, and we did an initial presentation on how do you understand and document context. Um, we're doing this presentation on policy. Um, there's a lot of work looking at implementation and implementation theory. And we thought that might be a helpful contribution is to look at that literature and bring it to this audience. And then we'll be recapping some of the work we did on looking at health systems, lenses, and levels. And I will explain that further. Um, we'd love to do more work. I'll be presenting our work on adolescent health, um, uh, looking at GFF country plans to look at how adolescent health is addressed. And we're developing a framework for looking at maternal and newborn as well. And then we have a very small uh, supportive role with the Exemplars Project, working with other partners. So that's our team um, for now. I'll come back to how we'd like to work with you, but let me hand over to Mary for the next session of um, this uh, joint presentation to give a few sort of introductory um, thoughts on how you do policy analysis. So uh, over to you, Mary. Great, thanks so much, Asha, and greetings, everyone. We really appreciate the opportunity to present today. Um, so I'm going to start by uh, just acknowledging that some of the slides have either been adapted from existing coursework at the School of Public Health at UWC or CHESI, which is a collaboration here in South Africa, or content was drawn from this very helpful health policy analysis reader published by WHO in 2018, which is a great resource for more information. Uh, next slide, please. So first, uh, let's define policy. Most people think of policy as a plan, but it actually can be broader than that. A policy can be considered as a decision-making process, it can be considered a set of decisions. And most people see these set of decisions as official or part of a plan, but these can also be unofficial and informal decisions. And sometimes people explicitly decide not to decide. So non-action is also a decision. And then a policy can be considered as um, policy intent and implementation. So you analyze the intended policy and how it was implemented. All of these are different aspects of policy that one would want to consider. Next slide, please. So here's an opportunity to reflect. I don't know, Asha, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and perhaps add into the chat, why do policies not always achieve in practice what they intended. So your thoughts on that, if you wanna just write that into the chat. Asha, I'm still, are you able to change to the next slide? Ah, thank you. Um, so a health policy as um, defined by WHO is um, decisions, plans, and actions that are undertaken to achieve specific health and healthcare goals within a society. So we're opening it up for um, just some thoughts from participants. Neha, thank you, political will. It's definitely something that may prevent policy from achieving what they intended. Just give another second if anyone else wants to throw in some thoughts. Okay. Next slide, please. No resources, thanks, Tees. Thinking, Tees. Under budgeted. All of these things are definitely part of that. Um, and policies often don't achieve what was intended because of power and processes. And as articulated in 1994 by Walt and Jilson, health policy is about process and power. Uh, it is concerned with who influences whom and the making of policy and how that happens. Um, and so human resources, thanks Asha, hardware and software requirements to sustain implementation are also factors. Um, next slide, please. So if we think about what is a policy process, it really consists of many complex sets of decisions, actions, and interactions entailed in developing policy and putting policy into effect. 
Uh, so this is a nice little visual of seeing how policy formulation and implementation is always looking involving negotiation, contestation, resistance. Uh, and so this is all part of the process. Next slide, please. So why, why study policy? And the reality is if we want to bring about change, technically sound documents and ideas on how to address the problem are often not enough. The reality is that our existing understanding and practices may not support our goal achievement, and we need to go deeper into understand the complexity of policy process. Next slide. Um, because policy analysis helps us to better understand the interactions between the various factors impacting on policy process, both the successes and the failures, and all of this is to think better about strategies to manage the process moving forward. Next slide, please. So we want to propose three um, considerations for health policy analysis kind of at a higher level um, and, and discuss them. And so for each of these, there'll be uh, opportunity for you to input on the chat and feel free to add your thoughts as we go. And at the end, we can kind of go back and revisit it or even after the presentation, um, we can have a broader discussion about some of your thoughts and experiences. So next slide, please. So the first is, um, what do you want to study? So I'm sure many of you have um, been done some sort of health policy analysis previously. If you wanna share um, what you study regarding policy, that'd be great. Or maybe you want to study something around policy um, moving forward and you can put that into the chat. Um, and if you think back to that first slide about what is a policy, then you also need to think about what part of the policy you want to study. So do you wanna study the policy process, including the formulation process and the intention of them policy, um, the content, for example, or is the focus on the use of the policy, policy as practice or implementation? And you may also want to think about why you want to study the policy. There's a difference between studies of policy and studies to inform and shape policies. So, so studies of policy would look at content um, of the policies, the process, actions taken by actors, the outputs, which are perhaps the determinants of policy outputs, um, often this is statistical, evaluations of policies as judged by these outcomes, and then analysis for policy, things that you would do to help inform policy making moving forward or for your advocacy. Just seeing, there's nothing yet in the chat box, but we can come back to it. And if you have been thinking about health policy um, in the context of your research, we'd love to hear what, what you're thinking about studying moving forward. Next slide, please. So the second question is how to study health policy analysis. Um, and there are a lot of frameworks and theories and some of them speak to different traditions. Um, so the, the stage uh, heuristic or the stage models that you see there is much more linear uh, um, whereas others are more complex and consider the messy realities of policy process. So these different frameworks and theories could include um, the policy triangle framework, which we'll talk about just now, the, the network frameworks, the multiple streams theories, punctuated equilibrium theories, many various implementation theories. And if you've used any of these theories or frameworks, we'd love to hear what your experiences have been. Um, maybe you can just add in the chat what theories or frameworks you've used in your research. Any inputs? So I'm using, for example, for some of my research, I'm using the normalization process theory, um, which isn't one of the ones listed here, but it does help um, understand the, the various actors and um, uh, their interactions. So there's many different frameworks and theories to look at and consider. Um, one, next slide please, that's an enduring framework, um, which I'm sure many of you have heard of is the um, policy analysis triangle. And this is a model for understanding the various sets of factors that are working within any policy process. Um, it's used because of its simplicity and because it goes beyond content to understand other critical aspects of policy process and how they all link up. So there are four key groups of factors underlying and influencing policy decision-making in the overall process according to this um, framework, context, process, content, and actors. 
And the inner linkages between these factors is actually much messier than the figure, this triangle figure um, shows or would suggest. Um, and for the most part, we would kind of, a, we, we have seen mostly that the maternal newborn child health um, community has primarily focused on policy analysis on content, but actually all these other components are also of equal importance. Um, next slide, please. And there's also many different study designs to consider. Um, so there, you, you know, Oftentimes you see policy analysis as a, a case study, single or multiple case study, um, ethnography, um, discourse analysis, uh, insider research accounts of experience, um, such as embedded researchers, uh, tracing policy change over time through historical or prospective work, um, specific analytical techniques such as stakeholder analysis and social network analysis, um, large scale quantitative data analyses and mixed method studies can all be different designs used for health policy analysis. And um, using conceptual or theoretical frameworks um, really deepen all of these types of analyses. Next, next slide, please. And so the third consideration we wanted to, to share are just some of the caveats. Um, and I'm gonna flag a few here. And if you are um, have had experience in health policy analysis and want to add some additional ones, please do so in the chat. We'd love to hear your thoughts. So one caveat is the temporal issues that need consideration. So are you doing a retrospective analysis or aiming to do um, concurrent policy analysis? Um, this extent to which policy analysis are focused on contemporary policy will have implications for your methods and for the questions that are asked. So short horizon approaches are sometimes appropriate and necessary uh, given the context in which you're trying to do the research. Yet policy evaluation requires a longer time frame than often our research or political needs um, have and allow for. Um, some suggest more than a decade is the minimum duration for analyzing any sort of policy cycle. Um, but there are limitations and challenges for doing such a, a lengthy study uh, in terms of data collection and analysis, including recall bias. Um, another uh, caveat is the positionality of researchers that needs to be considered. So how you're viewed or situated as a researcher, including your institutional base, perceived legitimacy, um, and prior involvement in the policy community um, really affects your ability to access the policy environment and conduct meaningful research. Um, so are you an outsider or insider? And this is gonna influence your access to stakeholders and their information. Likewise, your gender, class, education, uh, other factors are gonna influence your access and how much people will be willing to share, especially when investigating sensitive matters. This is something you need to consider when doing health policy analysis research. Um, another caveat is that some approaches to health policy analysis take time, um, such as ethno and embedded research. And the more in depth one is able to go, the deeper and more meaningful and informative the analysis can be but very few funders and studies allow for years of data collection analysis. That's, we oftentimes see uh, quick approaches, um, which may only scratch the surface of the complexity of the health policy. And these approaches tend to focus on measuring tangible inputs, policy context and outcome measures rather than the realities on the ground of health system complexity. Um, and then as noted um, previously, there are many pathways and approaches one needs to consider and Asha is gonna be speaking to the different frames uh, in which one can understand uh, and measure health policy um, and governance for RMNCAH. So there were some, there were some, I'm gonna slow down, apologies for speaking fast. Um, there are some additional caveats. Nope, frustrations, no, no. Okay, we have one. T says, good, you mentioned quick approaches and a country's annual health sector review policy analysis, analysis often equates with listing the policy changes that have been made in the last year. Is that enough? What else can be done in a short time period by the Ministry of Health and public health institution, institute teams, not necessarily experts in this area? So I don't know if that's a, a question to me, Tis, but I, I will say, I think um, we do need to consider how to go deeper um, and that uh, you know we can do these quicker approaches, but it doesn't always answer the questions in which we're trying to, to address. Um, and so bringing in experts in health policy, 
um, or social scientists um, and, and multidisciplinary teams um, could enrich some of the work you're trying to do. Okay. I'll go wonder, to the next. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if ahead. I can jump in here. And uh, I mean, there are others, I haven't looked at the full participant list, but there are others who have a lot of experience in this area. I wonder if, I think the policy timeline is a very important starting point as a descriptive um, um, first step in doing something like this. I, I don't know if anyone has tried to develop a kind of rapid assessment tool based on the policy triangle of saying, okay, here are the policy changes that happened. Who were the key actors involved were there key contextual factors and key mechanisms? Um, and to, to do a, a, a short case study of what were the policy changes. Um, I do think it need, we need something that meets the, the um, if you can't do a full-blown policy analysis, is there something in between a full-blown analysis and the policy timeline? And I don't know if there are, um, it also depends what, what is that analysis done for? So maybe for an annual review, just showing the policy timeline is enough. Um, but if we want to look at which are the actors we need to engage moving forward, then maybe doing a stakeholder mapping is important. As well. So it depends how you want to use the information as well. I don't know if there are other responses. And I realize both Mary and I are very passionate about this topic and talk too quickly. So I hope, um, should we pause here and see if there are any other responses from participants? Okay. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Africa Tawetwala. I've been trying to join uh, uh, this meeting in the past uh, three, three or two meetings. Uh, I register and normally I don't receive uh, the automatic uh, uh, link. I have to get it to one of my colleagues, Mandy, from Liberia, University of Liberia, but she's uh, from GFF. Now, I, I, I am, the last time I did a policy analysis was when I was doing my thesis. That is more than some 30 years ago, 1994. And I was looking at uh, population growth and distribution of health services. And, and that, that paper uh, was also published in a journal, presentation made to government, but one of the issues that is weakening uh, uh, health policy research, not only health policy, but uh, uh, development research as a whole in a country like Liberia, is that uh, the, the policy makers tend not to look at uh, uh, policy research, but they look at other, other factors. I don't know whether that happened in other countries in other, other part of the continent, but particularly Liberia and uh, some other countries, most, 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 most of the time, they don't look at uh, research from the academic, from the academia. Maybe people working, uh, working with, the, with the ministry, uh, using uh, facility, uh, like SARA, SARA report, or other research. Maybe they want, they want to look at, but it's, it's a problem. When you do a research and then not use a lot, I think that one of the weaknesses uh, that we experience, but but um, yeah, the policy analysis uh, that is being presented is very interesting, and we want to, very very interesting. And we want to be part of it to see how we can further strengthen our own uh, research uh, health policy uh, research. I, thank you so much for joining, and I'm so glad you um, the link worked for you this time. I'm sorry for the frustrations you experienced previously. Um, and I think it's uh, we really appreciate your frank observation that the data from policy analysis, um, that 
policymakers look for, you know, they're more open to data from SARA assessments or other types of data to um, orient them. I wonder if th there's a discussion on why that's the case. One could be they're making policy, so they think they know the history of what has happened. Um, uh, at the same time, um, I think it's also what are the case studies you could learn from. So I think the whole point of a little bit the exemplar study is to look at what has happened in other countries and are there key lessons that could be learned um, that from the uh, looking at a historical background. Um, I know in India, I used to be in a center of public policy. The top civil servants really look to look at what, what were successful reforms in other sectors and what could be taken through uh, and applied in their own sector. Um, that could speak much more to uh, the legacy of a British uh, administrative system where you have civil servants that cut ac across technical uh, sectors. So one day they work in health, another day they work in education, the next day they work in trade. So they're very interested in looking at what, how, does, how do things work in one area um, and how do they take the lessons forward. Um, it might be very different from uh, health systems that are not organized or um, public systems, government systems that are not administered in that, in that way. Um, I don't yeah. know if there are any other reflections. Yeah. 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 For example, the distribution or construction of hospitals, uh, according to some standard of WHO, I think some 100,000 or more persons should have a hospital. But in some cases, hospitals uh, could be constructed based on uh, the political interests of, of leaders. Okay, but in academia, for example, if there was a flight in many countries around us, like uh, Ghana or Sierra Leone, they will ask the Department of Geography or Environmental Science to explain why this, why this is happening. But that is a bit strange in, in my own country. But as time goes on, I'm sure uh, you know, that, that will happen because, uh, for example, hospital will be built somewhere where there are already hospitals because of the political interest. So instead of looking at the, the distribution of the population and the needs of the population, so a lot walk far, very far distances to reach the health centers, perhaps because they don't have the political population to vote, etc. I mean, they, these are some of the things, but as I said, we, 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 this, 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 uh, I'm happy to join this because I'm going to learn from it and maybe try to see how we can influence uh, some of, I'm from the University of Liberia Institute for Population Studies, to see how we can maybe influence uh, uh, other major stakeholders to, to see what, what I'm talking about and maybe in the future will be utilized. But this is, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, very, very helpful. And it reminds me years ago when I worked at the district level in India, trying to understand why the and over 10 years that I was uh, associated with that district, even with my first visit, I couldn't understand the geographic spread of hospitals. And over time, I could see the political decision making on where new PHCs were being built. But I think this is really useful. Um, input because we have a DAC dedicated to GIS um, and there could be ways in which we're doing, I'm sure that DAC does, and we have, um, I guess he's on the line, there's health facility data. Is there a way we look at, and I know that Una and uh, Loveday are really interested in the organization of, of service delivery. Is there a way we could over put on that map, voting um, constituency lines um, to look at is there a, a, um, uh, is there any link between the two um, and political party affiliation? Often, um, uh, which political party historically a state or district is linked to has huge implications for resource availability. And I don't know if that has come into the analysis. Um, it was very helpful. 
So I see, I'm just going to pause a little longer for any other, if um, I can't see the full list of participants, but if someone else would like to, you can always welcome, and I'm going to start reading the chats. There are a few chat messages from Agbesi, but if there are others who want to share their experience, Mary is having some trouble with her internet, so I just came to this slide with other key resources. The health policy analysis came out, it's hard to believe it came out two years ago, um, but it's really a wealth of the latest understanding of health policy analysis and different ways of applying it. And here's one listing of different tools and resources. Um, so while I respond to Bessie's uh, um, chats, I don't know if there's someone else who'd like to um, uh, unmute themselves and share their experience of health policy analysis or some of the challenges, or even some of the, are there some positive examples of um, doing any kind of policy analysis and what the learning was from there? Um, and the floor is open for you. Just unmute yourself. And I'm just going to read Agbesi's chat at the moment. Um, Thanks, Agbesi. I think both your points are linked to what is the timeline for policy analysis? Um, how quickly do policies change? Um, sometimes there might not be much change. There's incremental change as people improve what the policy is meant to do and how it's implemented. And sometimes there can be abrupt change linked to, as you said, crises, uh, shocks to the system, which can be both in terms of what's happened in the country, COVID-19, um, as well as political crises. Um, so I think the key thing is to narrow down the question further um, and to look at which aspect of policy. So do you want, are you looking at, for instance, um, policy around um, if abortion, um, that immediately takes you to a different part of the Ministry of Health, a different set of actors. The set of actors who are influential around safe abortion are very different from the, uh, I would say, the actors who are involved in malaria. Um, so I don't, I could be wrong, but usually religious leaders are not as involved, or they can be involved with malaria but they wouldn't have the same concerns. Um, so, and how actively is it contested? Um, there might be high, uh, whether there's consensus uh, in the direction in which policy takes also varies greatly by issue. So I think the key thing here in answering your question is to narrow down further and to talk about, is it access to medicines? Is it re a regulatory policy around, for instance, can community health workers prescribe antibiotics for pneumonia? Um, that automatically leads you to look at what's the policy for community health workers, um, how they're paid, but also drug regulatory, who are the bodies that um, decide on which health workers can prescribe or not, um, which are, does the human resources section of the Ministry of Health talk to the maternal child health section of the health sector. So I think it helps to unpack which is the issue you're looking at because that allows you to understand the different perspectives the different actors have. And usually the more consensus is the, at least there's, there are challenges still in implementation, but if there's a lot of lack of consensus, it can be hard to just even get policy made in that area. Um, so I don't know if that triggers any further thoughts or reflections, or if that answers your question. If there are others who want to share any experiences. I'm just gonna pause momentarily.
How many annual reviews have a section on, I had a question earlier on even knowing what are the types of, um, is, do annual reviews have any element description of policy in them? I think uh, this is Tis. Um, I think they rarely have any um, information on policies. And there's a section usually on the policy and the system changes in the last year. And of course, if you look at policies, you, you often do an analysis over a longer period of time. But an annual review focus on focus on what happened in the last year. So it's kind of difficult to step outside and then look back for for uh, let's say. Uh, longer period of time. So I think that policy analysis fits better in midterm or end line reviews than in annual reviews. Uh, but it still should, we should find ways in which uh, it can get greater prominence. And then not just the contents of the policies, but also, as you said, the actors process and context. Um, so I think that connection between social scientists, researchers, as I think also the gentleman from Liberia said, that was, is very important. But then to go beyond that um, in terms of what can you do for annual reviews, uh, I don't know. I think uh, it's probably more focused on what the system is actually doing rather than sort of the higher level uh, policy analysis. That's, that's helpful, Thies. And I think there are key things. If you're doing an annual um, assessment, there might be things linked to implementation that you're particularly interested in. And then if you want, having a longer time frame is more helpful to see changes on, on because policy does take, usually policy cycles take quite a bit long, are much longer than a year. And even if there's change this year, that change was initiated some time ago. Um, so that's helpful. Let me keep going because we have 20 minutes left. Um, we're always open to feedback um, and sharing of experiences because it, it, it is something that needs to, it's a conversation to see how, um, what are aspects of policy analysis that make sense for um, annual reviews, midterm reviews, um, other ways of taking stock of progress. So I'm going to, um, oops, I think I pressed the wrong, hold on. Okay, and here are some key references um, that we linked. Um, again, the, the reader is a fantastic resource, but there's this whole history of work on health policy analysis. Um, let me keep going. I want to present a little bit what the countdown, the drivers group has been doing and um, this framework in which we're taking forward different types of analysis. So um, one thing I was struck from and a reflection we had is how we look at RMNCH, how we look at health problems varies quite a lot from the, depending on the discipline or perspective you come from. And this is true for RMNCH, but could be true for various health conditions. And so we developed this framework to better understand what are different ways of understanding even um, um, the, the ways in which we approach health problems and health planning. So there is, we argued that a lot of us in public health focus have a framing of our real focus is vertical programs, certain health conditions, and what it takes to prevent those health conditions. So where I myself have a background in maternal and child health, and there are, for instance, the Lancet and various other ways, WHO has a list of key interventions, the health sector has an MCH um, uh, department, and they're very clear programs that address maternal and child health that really focus on service delivery. Um, and therefore has very sort of implementation plans of what are the tangible inputs in terms of what kind of health workers, what kind of medicines, um, what kind of training is needed, what needs to be there in health facilities for these programs to be implemented. And that's a very important perspective. 
Um, we also have at the same time people who really are very conscious. We have our human rights activists um, and many other people, also a lot of doctors I worked with in, in the health sector in India, you were very concerned with health inequalities. And in addition to looking at the programmatic inputs, really knew that when you go, when you are, and you see it at a primary healthcare facility, the patients who you don't see are the most marginalized. Um, the patients who keep um, coming back because they don't get cured are the most marginalized. So there are a lot of so social reasons um, the so social determinants of health, but also social factors that make it hard to deliver services. And so we need to look at that, the social cultural context as well. Finally, and this is where I brought in a lot of the recent, more recent health systems thinking, is that all of these things, we need to look at how the different actors come together and change over time. Um, and that's where a lot of systems thinking is um, in a very simplified way. Um, it really looks at you might make a change in implementing programs in one part of your health system, but that has knock on effects for other parts of the health system. And so we need to look at change over time in that way. I'm going to show you two examples of how we took this perspective of framework. We're, we're not arguing that one is more important than the other, but that we need a holistic approach at, when you do an assessment of a health program. So this is work that Mary has published. We drew from a lot of implementation theory to look at the issue of maternal and perinatal death surveillance and review. And death surveillance and response, sorry. So she did a literature review and she drew from implementation theory and looked at what were the key things from a service delivery lens. So uh, in terms of service delivery, there were skills and knowledge, um, how were policies put in place, the funding, um, who was the team that was put together, their incentives, um, the trainings that were provided, those were all the service delivery components. But at the same time, what's also important is the social relationships. So what were people's motivations? Um, how did they adapt and change things? Um, their ownership and, sorry, that's the darker frame. Their motivation and ownership, how they understood the initiative, um, the validity of the initiative, what were external actors and political pressures that uh, led to success or not, and team relationships. And then finally, the systems le level, what were key things that trigger change and adaptation over time? And so all of these things, um, we looked at the literature. And what was striking is when you look at these three different components, you realize that we are only documenting half the picture. So most of the literature focuses on service delivery issues. But even then, what we're measuring is very incomplete. Um, so even trying to understand what were the trainings delivered to people to implement maternal and perinatal death surveillance and response, it's measured very inconsistently. Were the training guidelines given? Uh, what were the, check, you know? Um, so even here, there could be a lot more done in being more systematic in how we document the service delivery inputs. There was very little about how people themselves um, accepted the intervention and their own motivations for implementing it, their own, uh, what was their uh, enabling environment and their ability to, um, their own perspectives. And finally, even fewer studies on looking at it over time. Um, and how did it link with other quality improvement initiatives? Many of these interventions, we maybe look at, for instance, implementation of um, uh, a certain intervention like um, IMCI, but IMCI doesn't happen by itself. It happens with many other programs. So what are the linkages between the two? What happens when a polio campaign comes and takes over? or COVID-19, all of these things disrupt the system and there's very little looking at these 
broader system changes um, and how they affect an intervention. So it gives you a sense of we're saying we need more different ways of looking at a program and how it's implemented. Um, we uh, were prompted to look at the GFF investment cases and the World Bank project appraisal documents and to do an analysis using this uh, framework of adolescent health. Um, so this is work that will be published, I think, piece in May. It's part of the supplement that um, Sheikh and Tees have been editing. Um, and it looks at the first 11 countries that went through the GFF that we could access documents on. It's a very imperfect analysis because we looked at what's on paper. Um, it doesn't mean that that's actually being implemented, but it's one measure of commitment. And I'm realizing I'm already talking too fast, so apologies. Um, but it's still an important analysis. It might not capture all the power dynamics, but it's a starting point to look at what's there on paper, what is, it's one sign of commitment. And then to be able to, it gives you a baseline um, after which you can look at implementation. So our analysis showed several things and we, this is one visual, only one part of the analysis. Um, there's a lot of variability. Um, so adolescent health, there's a good overall commitment to adolescent health by the GFF, at least in the broad policy priorities. And there are some very good examples, but it is not addressed systematically um, across all the countries, um, nor from investment case to PAD. Um, and even when you look at uh, what we did was a content analysis. We looked at the investment cases and the PADs and looked at how they addressed adolescent health. Even if there was at least content that addressed adolescent health, when it went to indicators, there were fewer, sometimes the content didn't translate into indicators. And then looking at commitment in terms of actually investment was less. Um, what also shows the complexity of this analysis is if it's in the investment case, that doesn't mean that it will be in the PAD um, because there are other drivers of what is a priority in the PAD. The flip side of it, there were a whole bunch of countries where adolescent health wasn't in the investment case, but the PAD picked it up as a critical issue. So there's a lot of, you know, I think each of these case studies then can prompt further analysis to understand um, this complexity. But it shows you, it's one way of at least even understanding the content, what's there and what could be improved on. So following our, the, the lenses approach, we found that what's the programmatic entry point? Many of the documents have prioritized adolescent friendly health services and school health programs, including um, sexuality education, but this isn't systematically done um, or necessarily systematically invested in. There could be a lot more done there. Um, what was positive is that the social determinants and the vulnerability of key populations is acknowledged and gender in particular as gender inequality as a driver or barrier to adolescent sexual and reproductive health is listed. But what's striking is that hardly very few countries then had recommendations or investments. And I think the exception was Bangladesh because they had a PAD on education and they really invested in girls' education and several um, reforms linked to school health. Um, Mozambique, which has a very systematic um, gender policy and a number of programmatic inputs. And if I remember correctly, Kenya and Cameroon had cash transfer programs that targeted adolescent girls. Um, what's important also, we thought, so you need the concrete programmatic entry points, you need to address the social determinants, and then who are the actors you need to really enlist? Um, this is an area that requires multi-sectoral action, and it was striking I think particularly the World Bank has an opportunity to work not just with ministries of health, but with other sectors. 
And therefore, we did an analysis of um, how multi-sectoral action was listed. There were a few, again, very good examples, um, Liberia in particular, I remember, uh, from what we read in the documents, but much more could be done throughout. So in terms of recommendations, I think there's a lot of good examples of these two entry points, but they could be invested in more systematically. A lot more work done on gender equality interventions, looking at social norms, not just acknowledging it's a program, but actually investing in that area. And for what was striking to us is given that so many adolescents are not necessarily in school, the importance of community-based initiatives. So you need to strengthen existing program, programmatic entry points, but also broaden your focus and, sorry, um, look at other ways of engaging other sectors um, and key populations in, in this work. Um, so that's one example of, it's not an annual analysis, but just even looking at the investment cases and the PADs, what we could learn about policy commitment um, and how adolescent health is mentioned in, in, in the GFF planning documents. Moving forward, um, there's interest in continuing this work. Um, so we, we've been asked, we're thinking of continuing the focus on adolescent health, but also looking at maternal newborn, um, partnering potentially with saving newborn lives on this. And I think it's important to have a, a health condition, but also have these cross-cutting topics. So really sharpening how we look at issues of quality in the GFF um, documents. And I think we're, we're still working out how we do this, but it would be great to get feedback or questions, looking at more countries, but also potentially looking at the annual reviews because the investment case and the PADs are two points uh, in, in time, but really some of them, the annual reviews tell you something else. And you know what could be other documents that could help create a, a different ways of tracking policy commitment to these issues. Um, so we're just formulating the work plan. So it would be great to hear from you in terms of, um, is there, are there ways of doing more work together on this? Any other thoughts or experiences on this? Thank you. I think we have just seven minutes. I hope I didn't speak too fast or five minutes. Welcome any feedback you may have. Um, I think our emails are here in the next slide. Uh, there's a web page for some of our outputs um, and our emails. Um, so I don't know if this, uh, if there are any thoughts or uh, reflections from the group. Okay, I will just be very short. Um, we are looking at the the investment case, uh, and uh, from our our colleagues from London, Onai and Karen. And one of the things we found out is what you just what what you just mentioned the, the issue of quality. Uh, for example, in ANC ANC four plus, but then you still have uh, maternal mortality coming up high. So these are the issues we are looking at and to see what are the issues of quality uh, in terms of signal functions, uh, in terms of uh, how many deliveries are done per clinic, are some clinics just uh, doing very less deliveries. Uh, these are some of the findings we are trying to, to uh, these are some of the things we are trying to discuss or to research on to, to get the findings what's responsible for quality if there is a high level of attendance of ANC, ANC 4 plus, then why are we still having a high mortality, high maternal and new 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 data, new data deaths? So those are the, some of the issues we are looking at. And we also uh, have uh, developed indicators uh, that the government has agreed with. So we're trying to 
now do the analysis and, uh, and then present the findings to government. But but as I said, and, and as you mentioned and earlier, the issue of how policy, policy analysis can be finalized to be integrated into, into national policy uh, in timeliness is, is, is one issue. So uh, I just want to pause on that since, since I, I came late and I just wanted to make that, just to make a few comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it would be great to keep in touch to see. I think the issue is, we know quality is a serious issue, but how can it be flagged? Uh, how can commitments be articulated in the pl planning documents? I think we're also exploring what, what, what do we want to see in the planning documents so that people have the resources to affect change. Thank you. Any other experiences or thoughts? Questions? Just, just a quick one for me. Right now, I'm using a link that was sent to me by, by my GFF colleague, Mandy. So I will try to register again and see if, if I have some emails, then I can write and say I have registered, but I have not received the signal. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dennis. Maybe there could be a special outreach. No, no, to, you see, now now, to now you are saying Dennis, you are saying Dennis because I'm using Dennis's uh, <laughs> link. But my name is Africa Tawitwala. And okay. she has to send me the link so that I will be able to talk. So I will uh, register, but I don't receive the automatic link to go to this. So uh, perhaps it's, it's, uh, it's something that I need to, you know, I need to you know, get an email and write and say, look, I have registered, but I haven't received. I know it's automatic from the machine, but so she shared her link with me. That's why I'm talking. Yeah. Thank My you. Dear Dennis. So, okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. uh, hello. 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 Go ahead. Yes. In addition, yeah. In addition, what I, after they saying, I register. I'm I'm Jita City and I'm from the University of Liberia, and uh, we are working on the same. I'm working on the same project with uh, Mr. Trolla and uh, Madie from Liberia. And uh, the what we are all uh, using. We are all using our link. Yeah. Hello. Go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. So, yeah, yes, I re we register and then uh, we still don't receive the direct link. Can, can you please try to add our name to, to your link so that we can receive it directly? So I yes. think you've received an uh, assurance from TIS. I think there's going to be a countdown delegation coming to Liberia um, to support all of you. Brittany, did okay. you want to come in? No, if, and if you guys want to, can you send me your names in the chat box? And that will also the chat help box? me. Or, or yeah. we, could, or could just send, we could just send you a direct email. Yes, you can. If you want to, just, just send me your, your address and we send you your email directly. Okay, and, you, you can do that. Names. And okay. I can make Thank sure you. you have the correct link for the next session as well. Okay. So for your email is bfergal at ghu? bfergal1 okay. at jhu.edu. Is, 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 is it in a, in a, I see, thank you, I see the email addresses below. Is it part of them? In the last, on the last slide? No, but though that's okay. my email address. My name is Asha and there's Mary. But in the chat function, I have put the details of Brittany, Virgo, who can help you moving for okay. forward. All right, thank you. Just writing up out well, her name because we have people with many different accents and languages on this call. So anyone, okay. it's good that the colleagues from Liberia listed this, but anyone who has had challenges joining, please get in touch with Brittany. And I wanna thank you, we're on the hour. Um, we look forward. Mary and I have our email addresses here. If there's anything else uh, from your side in terms of looking at the investment cases, the PADs, the annual reviews, um, please do get in touch with us. We'd love to work with you. 
Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.